like critics, but very sparingly. Um, Ocon has already presented the diacritics for the tone, and then we used um, the subject to represent some of those sounds that uh, we needed to find special symbols for. And then there was also the bar that, we, as you will see as we go on, but we had some challenges. The phonological processes that he also tried to talk about pose a lot of problems, especially with regard to the assimilation of vowels. So we, we, for a long time, we debated on this, whether to use brackets to um, indicate that something, some vowels would not be pronounced, or whether to use apostrophe. So, um, you know, all of that took a lot of time, but eventually we decided not to use any of them and just use the underlying forms. And then the weakening that we also had about those problems. Sometimes we didn't know whether to represent a particular allophone as um, a particular style scene, but to represent the different allophones. I've been told that my time is going. So let me just go to the orthography. So here are the symbols that we proposed for the stops, the plosives. We have um, four categories of the plosives. Um, these are the symbols that we have. I'm going to read the text in the end, so we'll just run down the, the, the symbols. But note that the, the bilabial um, the, the stops, even the P also sometimes has an allophone of um, some sort. And the alveolar also has allophone. So all, whenever there's allophone, we just represent them with one sound. And then we have um, four um, categories of the nasals. Now, the villa nasal is particularly interesting. We weren't sure initially whether to use this bar on top of the N or to use the English symbol, which is NG. But then the issue of it occurring as a um, syllabic nasal with the tone would make it look odd if it occurs at the beginning of the word, so we chose to use the, the bar. Um, and then here we have the, the fricatives. The villa fricative is particularly interesting. Uh, as Paul said, we thought we should give it a symbol because it's everywhere in the language. So we're not too sure whether it is... Um, we believe it's a phoneme, but we couldn't find it in the initial position. Maybe we need more data. And then we have other others like um, the applicant, the tree, the lateral, the approximate, and the palatal sounds, which we represent with the symbols that you see there. And so, um, with regard to the vowels, we use the same letters that are used in English, except for the 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 e, the front open vowel e, which we had to use the sub dot and the open o, which we use the sub dot to differentiate from the o and the e. Uh, with regard to the tones, we, we have the high and low tones, and we decided not to mark the downstep. So we mark high and low tones. Uh, so phonemically, even though we use the, what it looks like, the exclamation mark in the spelling, we leave the downstep or mark. And so this is a sample of um, uh, the lexicon that we built up using this orthography. And so in a word like um, red, we have arara. Now, you see, we have four fields in this lexicon so far. We have the orthographic entry, the pronunciation, the word class, and the, the meaning. Now, we plan to have more, more than this. We plan to have the pronunciation, <coughs> maybe pictures, and some sample sentences eventually. But this is as far as we've gone. So the lexicon looks like this. And so far, we have up to about 350 um, words in, in that lexicon. And so um, we, the pronunciation is to guide what to reach this. So for instance, a word like um, afia familie, which is the noun for white shirt the type that Chris is wearing, represented like that. <laughs> and then a, a word like uh, the first market day in that country, we have a bribon. The, you see the E, the, 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 the E is the bad one. 
but you know, since we agreed that we represent the allophones and the, the the phonics with the same symbol, so it is spelled like that, and that is the pronunciation. And then, um, so that's the an idea. I put it. <laughs> all it means all. It's a particular for all. That is not just. Um, we have a foot for all, and then a foot that is all in its totality. And uh, so that's uh, one place that the orthography was useful. And then here is our monkey song text. Now, you see, it's, if you notice, I have put some sounds in, I believe that is some kind of pink color. <laughs> Those are the sounds that are, do we say, deleted? In the text when it's written. So in, in the, the point is, as I said earlier on, we were wondering, should we remove the E? Because if you leave it there, it, it makes it difficult to read. But since this is formal text, we think that it should be spelled completely and without the brackets to distract one. But I believe that in informal use, they can use Ostrom, they can use many devices, but formally, they will be there like this. <laughs> and so this is the text for the monkey story. I think I stopped. So that is uh, what we are presenting. I want to say that I had a lot of fun doing this. I've not done this for a long I've not done linguistic work for a long time, so it was a wonderful time with the with that team. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. place to start. A verb, also a good place 
also a good thing to have. And then we have our object. So um, the deer eats those two pairs, and those two pairs is your whole object. We also have subject and verb agreement. Um, so here's our verb, and we just have a nice little agreement prefix. There's nothing too complicated going on here. Um, that prefix just always agrees with um, the subject, and then oh here. <laughs> so this has gotten um, a little messed up, but we have both an affirmative and a negative version, and um, you aren't expected to remember all of this, of course, but you can see that there are different ones for each of the persons, and you can differentiate them quite nicely. Um, Katie will show you at some point a few hiccups in this system, but this will work pretty well as a guide to get you started. So I'm going to hand it over to Katie. talking about the pronoun system in a dog, um, and I'm not going to talk about all the different types of pronouns. I'm pretty much going to focus on personal pronouns, which means uh, words that stand in for people, words that describe people, groups of people, um, and the subcategories that I'm going to look at here are possessive pronouns, reflexive pronouns, uh, reciprocal constructions, emphatic pronouns, and logophores. Uh, I'm Fawn's favorite thing. <laughs> Uh, so I'll start by introducing a really simple um, personal phenomenal <coughs> paradigm for Uda. Um, so I've, in all of my paradigms, I'm going to give you the English equivalent in the middle, and then you can see the Uda translation on the right. Um, so you'll see from this paradigm that there's a three-way distinction in number. We have first, second, and third person. I'm sorry. And then there's a three-way distinction in person. We have first, second, and third person forms. And there's also a two-way distinction in number between the singular version and the plural version. This is a simple present verbal inflection paradigm, uh, which is the verbal agreement that Caroline just mentioned. Um, so if you can compare the English in the middle to the Uda on the right, um, you'll see that Uda has a much more robust system of verbal inflection. Uh, every uh, person and every number has a morpheme that corresponds to that person and number. Um, so it's probably worth mentioning that verbs in da appear to be universally consonant initial. Uh, so it kind of makes sense then, looking back at this verbal inflection that attaches to the beginning of the verb, that these would all be vowels, and also we have this cloud of nasal for the first person singular. Um, so given that they are vowels and syllabic nasals, they are more prone to uh, phonological processes like assimilation. So throughout the slides, you might see um, things that are glossed as a verbal agreement morpheme that look different than these, but that's probably just due to some phonological processes at work. Okay. Um, so now we have a little bit of an understanding, hopefully, of what the verbal inflection looks like and also what the pronouns look like. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how they interact. Um, where do we see the pronouns show up? Now, given that we have such a robust system of verbal inflection, it kind of makes sense that a lot of the, the burden of identifying the subject of a clause can be done by the verb, not necessarily um, by an explicit subject. So often we'll see that the pronouns are left out. So this example here, in sentence one, you have the appearance of the pronoun ami, but in the second, it's left out, the sentence is exactly the same, and the meaning is completely recoverable. They, they mean the same thing. Um, so when you do see pronouns, they're often just there for extra clarity or for emphasis. Uh, the one exception to that is the third person plural, uh, which, although it might not be strictly obligatory, our consultants always gave um, when they used that person. Um, the first person plural and the second person plural are identical. Uh, uh, their, their verbal morphology is identical, so you might be more likely to see those in a, in a clarifying context. Uh, 
object and subject pronouns. So many languages have different forms for the pronouns when they function as an object versus when they function as a subject. Um, so we've already seen the subject version, um, but it turns out in the dot it doesn't matter the role that the, the pronoun is playing in the sentence, whether it replaces the subject, the direct object, or the indirect object, it always appears in the same form. So we've got a quick example here. Um, I love him and he loves me are the same. Um, I mean, they're not the same. <laughs> Those are very different things. <laughs> but um, the ami appears in the same form, and the third person singular pronoun, I me, appears in the same form. Uh, moving on to possessive pronouns. Uh, this is our paradigm of possessive pronouns in Uda. Uh, again, we have the English equivalent in the middle, and the Uda translation on the right. So this is my, your, his, her, its, our, your, plural, and their. Um, once again, you'll see that these tend to be actually the same form of the pronoun, except for the third person singular, which has a unique uh, possessive form called isiki. And uh, that's not going to be the first time that the third person acts up on us. Um, I'll talk really briefly about different strategies for representing flexibility in the language. Um, so these are our six <laughs> different options for saying if Rete hit himself, as given by our consultant. Um, so the first version is uh, with the reflexive particle, uno, uh, which roughly translates to self. Our second option is with ile, which is body. We think it's a, a lexical item that's kind of in the process of becoming grammaticalized or often used to indicate reflexivity um, somewhat akin to self. Um, in the third example here, you'll see that ile can be possessed by the possessive pronoun iski. Um, and in example four, you'll see that uno does not have that same power, so that cannot be possessed. Um, two other options are uh, combinations of ulo, uno and ile and uno and sin, which is the uh, word for one. Uh, so five and six are just uh, to indicate the only two things that uno can um, can appear with. It can only appear with ile and sin, but ile is a slightly freer form and it can, it can be modified in, in many other ways. So I guess this is just to show uh, the many different ways you can talk about reflexive situations, but also to show that we see the same uh, form of the pronouns. Again, we have this weird form of the third person possessive, isuki, uh, but remember that every other form is the same. So if this were for any other person, you would see um, the same pronominal form as you would in the subject, direct object. Uh, really briefly, reciprocals are constructed <coughs> in the same way as reflexive. So I have these two sentences here, Edak and Efreti saw each other at the party, versus Edak and Efreti saw each other in the picture. Uh, the first one of those is a reciprocal event, and the second one of those is uh, a reflexive, and you'll see that ile mo, ile mo, those are exactly the same, although I just made a weird tonal difference. Ignore that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now just really briefly to take stock of what we talked about in the phenomenal inventory. Um, Uda has many fewer distinct forms than English does when it comes to forms of pronouns. Um, and that means that the same form can have very different meanings depending on the context it appears in. Um, so we have the same exact form of the pronoun, functioning as the personal subject pronoun, the personal object pronoun, possessive pronoun, and it's the same thing that we see in reflexive and reciprocal constructions. Uh, again, with the one exception of the third person singular, possessive form. Except. Um, this brings us to the other <laughs> really, uh, really interesting thing in the language. This is something I had studied um, in, a, in a small syntax seminar, and I never thought I would get to see in the wild, but it turns out uh, <laughs> they appear in Uda, and this is a thing called logophores. Um, so, what are they? <laughs> Good question. Um, logophores is a term that was first introduced by a linguist named Hagej in uh, 1979. Uh, they're a pretty common feature in West African languages, um, and they're essentially just a separate phenomenal form that's used in reported speech. Um, so I have this example here of Efrete said he left, where Efrete and he are not co-indexed, meaning that Efrete is a different person from that he. And you see that you, we get the standard um, form of a third person singular pronoun, ami, 
along with the standard third singular uh, verbal morphology of all. And in the second version here, where Efrete say, said that he left and he refers to Efrete, we get a totally different form, which is this imo, that's our third person singular logophore, and nyo is the logophoric verbal inflection on the, on the verb to leave. So, yes. Um, that's our intro to how logophores work in Da, um, but I'll tell you a little bit about how they work uh, in general. Uh, so some languages only have logophoric pronouns, some only have logophoric verbal inflection, and others have both of those features. Um, some can only use logophores when talking about the third person, other can use them when talking about the third person or the second person. Um, also, some languages, they're strictly confined to the context of recorded speech, um, but in others, you can use it in a wider um, array of semantic or sentential contexts. So, logophores in Yudha are pretty interesting. They can appear in a really wide variety of semantic contexts. So, um, any situation that's reporting the thought or speech or action of another person, um, you might expect to see a logophore as long as you're in, in the third person. Um, our logophore pronouns are imo and mo, uh, which contrast with the non logophore versions of the third person pronouns that are ai and mo. Mo, okay. Tone is a struggle for me. Um, but you can see that the difference between imo and ai is much sharper than the difference between mo and mo. Uh, so, yeah, it might, it might be confusing in the third person plural there. Um, we have special verb agreement when the logophore is the subject or part of the subject, which I'll talk about in just a second. And we have the same verbal inflection, which is this E with a low tone um, for the third person singular and the third person plural. So, um, given that we only have third person logophores and given that it's the same verbal inflection for both, uh, we reduced our glossing a little bit to just say logophore singular, logophore plural, or logophore for the verbal inflection. Um, last note is that this uh, morpheme seems to be opaque to any phonological processes like assimilation, um, in contrast to the non logophoric third person singular um, morpheme. Uh, so you'll see in all of our examples that this E never changes. All right. One more quick example of logophores in Uda. This is the example we saw earlier with Frechten saying he left. I just wanted to give you an illustration of how the third person plural works with the logophore. So in this first one, they said they left where they and they that did the leaving are different compared to the fourth example here where they and they that did the leaving and they that did the saying are the same they. Um, you'll see that the only difference that is remarkable is the uh, change in tone on the mo. Um, so we have the non-logophoric in, in example three and the logophoric in example four. When do we see the verbal morphology? All of the time. <laughs> any time that the logophore is the subject of the clause and any time that the logophore is part of a complex or coordinated subject, uh, you're going to see the logophore verbal morphology. So here we have an example of Efrete said he left, Efrete said he and the other boys left, Efrete said he and you left, and Efrete said he and I left. So, oh, they are not all number two, but in this, <laughs> in this bottom example here, um, it's, it's really interesting because um, you would probably expect at least the first person to trump the presence of the logophore, there, uh, but it doesn't work, and you always get the logophore uh, verb agreement. So, uh, like I said, it's present on, this is a loose definition, I'm not sure if it's going to hold water yet, but it, it's the verbal morphology of the logophore is present on verbs whose third person subject is co-indexed with the person doing the reporting or experiencing of the action. Um, and it's obligatory on all verbs that meet this criteria, which in a dog can be many, many verbs. So this is one of our favorite sentences from the monkey story. 
It is an uda sentence with seven different verbs, and the subject uh, of the embedded clause is the logophore. So we have, um, and this logophore is the pronoun, but every subsequent logophore or log here on the gloss indicates the logophore verbal morphology. So you can see that there's really no limit to how much of this you can pack into a single sentence. <laughs> Uh, really briefly, we'll talk about how these function in other contexts. So, looking at embedded clauses, often the content of the reported action. Um, Logophores function very similarly to the other pronouns we talked about in the DAO, which means that the subject, object, um, I'm sorry, subject, direct object, indirect object, possessive forms are all the same, and it behaves predictably in reflexive and reciprocal constructions. So, um, just give a nod to some of the things that we still need to look at here. Um, the, it's interesting, the uh, cases I pointed out where the logophor um, seems to trump other persons that are involved and override them and you get the logophor for morphology even when you have a subject that's plural or involves a first or second person um, might be evidence for a larger system of a hierarchy in verb agreement. Um, some attestations that we got from our consultants suggested that logophore global morphology might be enough to convey reflexivity and you don't have to overtly um, express it using one of those forms that I talked about. And finally, uh, we need to look at the binding constraints in this language and exactly how that applies to logophores. So lots more to work on, but that is all I will say about, about that. So thank you everyone.